Dope Shit Podcast. Season seven. Season seven. That's the part Epis- that I knew. You got to do the episode part. <laughs> episode 17, <laughs> I think. Yeah. You are correct. Man, we're almost yeah. uh we're almost through another mighty season of Dope Shit Podcast. I know. That's this amazing. T minus four episodes. I know. Stuff. Including this one. So so today, um, I may sound a little bit different. Um, Banana may also sound a little bit different. I always sound different. Um, You know, for those that don't know, they're listening to the podcast through iTunes or Spotify or Google, whatever they do. I guess they do podcasts. Um, We're there if they do it. I don't know what they call their service. They change the name of it all the time. Um, But if you're listening in an audio format, via a subscription thank you first of all we haven't thanked anyone in a long time like it's been like (laughs) it's been like like three to four selfish years of not thanking our listeners but uh, fuck (laughs) y'all thanks a lot thanks a lot thanks Thanks for nothing to the the people that skipped the talking part fuck you guys um (laughs) but yeah thanks to everyone that listens to the to the episodes um (laughs) there's somebody like wow you could do that Um, (laughs) so um yeah, I'm trying something different today. We have started um, putting, you know, the talky parts of the show up on the Uncommon Records YouTube page. Um, by the time you hear this, um, the last episode that we did uh, reflecting on Doom's career uh, memories and, and some of our favorite albums of his will be up on the YouTube. So go to youtube.com slash Uncommon Records and look for the playlist with Dope Shit Podcast uploads. Um, this will be the second of those. If you check out that first video, you'll witness me kind of looking at the screen like I'm in a hostage situation because I'm also talking into a microphone that is to my side, which was my my amazing AKG microphone that I've always used for the show. I'm now using sort of like a, a little conference microphone. So hopefully it's picking me up well. Um, at least well enough for the audio side. I know for the video, when you see a moving mouth, it's totally fine. But like, you know, hopefully the audio works for an audio podcast and it'll make NASA's life much easier when he has to edit um, all of these things. And when I refer to myself in a third person, I mean me. Um, so yeah, for this episode, um, I uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, this Netflix film that I saw or film documentary series that I saw. I don't know if you had a chance to check it out. Probably not, right? No, you know I didn't. Okay, cool. I, I, I knew this already. I just, I was, maybe there was like I, a 10% chance of a surprise. You never know. I really wanted to, but I did not <laughs> get a chance to. <laughs> um, man, wanting is half the battle. Um, so, so, so yeah, I, know, I was very close to doing it. Um, I almost, almost did. Almost did my homework. Um, <laughs> I never so, did. So there's this there's this documentary series called um, Pretend It's a City, okay? And long story short, it is sort of like a Taylor made series for for me for New York <laughs> NASA. Um, it's the series that follows a woman who I had not heard of. Maybe I heard the name before, but I had not heard of her previous. A woman named Fran Lebowitz, and um, Fran Lebowitz is a, is a um, sort of like an old school um, writer in New York. She wrote um, a bunch of stuff for magazines and periodicals and wrote some books uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And I think she stopped in the 90s. Um, Anyway, long story short, she's like an old cranky lady um, that lives in New York that, you know, has an accent mannerism that is unique to this city. And um, I was like, well, shit i might as well watch this because there's no one from new york left here so i have to watch fellow like actual like born and bred new yorkers on television now that's that's where we are as a city um so you can see why i like the show um so she just basically complains about shit um which is cool it's really weird because like her personality is sort of interesting enough that she's able to hold down like seven episodes of what are mainly just interviews and chats with like some other clips sprinkled in um point of it is though the second episode was the one episode where i kind of like really disagreed with what she was saying and she was talking about talent and um i wanted to spark that not really to talk about 
her in that series anymore, but just to talk about w- what I think and and get some some feedback from, from Banana and see where we are with talent. Um, in the series, well, I have none. <laughs> that is not true. It's a lie. Yeah, um, true. Um, <laughs> I can do that. No. Um, <laughs> so, so in a series, she talks about um, she talks about her opinion of talent is that uh, most people are not talented enough to really share what they're creating and should stop. And hmm. that um, if you're, I guess the point of it is, is that point of view to me is, is really like unfair. And I think it goes to this key misunderstanding about talent, artistic talent, that you were born with it as if, you know, it comes via kismet or something. Um, and, and I, I disagree with that. I don't know if, if you've thought about this before, like, you know, in terms of talent, and this goes beyond hip hop or, or even music, like in any artistic form we're, we're talking mm-hmm. about here, uh, whether it be writing or visual arts or, or anything like that. Um, you know, have you thought, do you have an opinion on that? Like, you know? I mean, I definitely think that what she said is like, like, I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, yeah, talent is, you know, I think, I think that ta- like there is truth to part of what she's saying, I guess, but like, it doesn't just like, like talent evolves, mm-hmm. you know, like you aren't, you aren't just born with talent and like, you're good to go. Like, like even like prodigies need training and need to get better and practice and everything. And I think most people, like if they do, if they are passionate about something and practice it constantly, then they can sort of generate talent. Um, but I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I, I, I think the talent is honed. Um, I think there's a difference between, um, it also depends on how you define talent. I mean, I guess, you know, the, the elephant in the room is that talent is subjective. This is, you know, so regardless of what anyone thinks talent is, there's always going to be a layer of subjectivity to it. So just because person A thinks that this person is a hack and shouldn't share their visual art on Instagram or thinks that this person is a hack and should never release music on Bandcamp doesn't mean that they actually are hacks. They, they mm-hmm. actually may just not be finding the right audience. Yeah. So there's that level of subjectivity right off the top. Like that's uh, everyone that's listening probably is thinking that. So I just want to put that out there right away. Um, in terms of like actual talent, I, I think there's a, there's a, a way to think about it. Um, I don't think, and especially now that I am sort of dabbling with painting and and collage, like the amount of things that you need to know to paint, like artistically is pretty off the scale. Like I, I finally know why people go to art school because if you, you know, I mean, different materials of paint. Mm-hmm. ways to clean your brushes how to dispose of acrylic paint when it's done um how to use the knife uh what surface to paint on you know all of these different things and then then you get into styles that's even a different level but like just knowing the science of painting mm-hmm. the chemical compounds the different you know like gesso and and like um um, all these different things that like wet in acrylic paint so that it comes on with different consistencies. Like how could anyone know how to do that without being trained? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And like, and that's a key part of, of painting, you know, that's a key part of doing it. And just like with, with making music, you know, I mean, you have to know, you know, how to, uh, at the very least, you have to know what a measure is. You have to know the difference. You have to have a decent ear of, of, you know, learning like BPMs and knowing like this is fast, this is slow and, and mm-hmm. 
understanding that you, you have to have an ear that that understands tune even if you can't read music which i can't um you know you have to be able to tell that something's out of tune when it's out of tune and that comes with practice and learning and honing your your ear and i i think that talent is is defined by practice but it's also defined by like your the only thing that's natural about talent is if you're if you're not prone to enjoying painting or enjoying making music or enjoying writing you know what i mean like i, I think that anyone can be taught but there has to be a willingness to to it you know from from a young age, like I was attracted to music before I even knew that I could make music. Music meant something to me, you know, as early as five or six or seven years old, like I can remember the music that I listened to as a small child. And it, it actually was pretty dope. I had good taste from early on. I was mostly listening to Run DMC and like Fat Boys and Houdini, but, um, and Tears for Fears, um, but. Very different. One of these things is not like the other. I don't know. You know, like it, it all in the 80s, it all <laughs> kind of fit together. You know, they were all using the same drum machines and synthesizers. <laughs> I can tell you that much. Um, but that being said, like, you know, I, I guess there was something that was God given to me that that, you know, you could say that is a talent. But if you don't hone that talent, then it's wasted, you know, mm. Um wasted is a strong word because there's a lot of people in situations worldwide that they may be born with the same inclination that I was, but not be in any sort of like situation economically, culturally, or socially to, to, to hone those skills. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that that's an important distinction in talent. Um, yeah. and I, and I, and I think that once you get to knowing like what your calling is or what your instinctual following is, then it comes with practice and learning. And, and I, I firmly believe I've said this, I've said this on tour, um, probably with you because we had like, you know, we had opening acts that were new at doing music. Um, to put it lightly, some of them, you know, were comfortable in front of other humans, but what they were doing in front of other humans was not the best of what they were going to become, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I firmly believe, and I always would say this about opening acts, not that they were a huge topic of discussion on any of my tours, but like um, that it was like, yo, give people a chance to fucking learn and, and figure themselves out before you just say that guy sucks, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I think a lot of people like to do the test of like um, old school people did this to me. Um, if 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 you would ask, like people would give you any opportunity to quit. That's what the previous generation to mind would do. They would always say, oh, well, you know, I don't know. This is this is the best you got. You might as well quit now. And it was like this test that like, people from that 60s and 70s era I feel like would give each other to maybe have less competition but like <laughs> to just be like yo if the motherfucker like doesn't keep going then he or she was never meant you know to do this shit mm -hmm. um it's kind of a ramble but like I, I guess my point is like I think um I think the idea that you're born with talent and you wake up you know, these child prodigies and things like that. I, I think being a child prodigy comes from having some level of like experience and exposure. Right. I mean, I don't know, I'm not an expert on child prodigies, but how that shit works. Never understood the idea all that well. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the only example. That's what you have to go to. If you believe that. Yeah talent is given but like not every talented person was a child prodigy so how does that work yeah. if you believe that talent I, is given to you from the very beginning i feel like everybody just starts out shitty <laughs> you yeah know? like it's impossible not to like because you, you can't just approach something 
not knowing what it is and just like instantly like 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 if you are playing if you are a musician you can't in, just like walk up to an instrument and like understand exactly how it goes if you've never ever like picked up an instrument in your life before that's that's just never going to happen and beyond that you know you you learn an instrument still have to learn how to like song you know you still learn structure or at least understand structure you know to try making things and what wasn't what doesn't like pretty much a great work of anything every really great work of art in any realm is born out of failure like many failures before it, you know it's like yeah. think that talent really comes perseverance and if anything said maybe talent is a form of perseverance you know like and maybe that's a thing that you are born with it is just, it born with is like just this sort of innate ability to keep trying yeah you know and just keep at it and keep developing and yeah I totally agree. And I, and I, what you said that sparked me is like, I, you know, as I like try to create visual art as, as shitty as I can. Um, and as I try to do some writing, you know, short fiction and like, you know, non rhythmic poetry, which I've been doing all of those things. And it's really helped me to sort of just be a more well-rounded artist. Um, but a lot of those things, you know, I mean, I'm new at those things again. Mm -hmm. so it it's interesting to do those things for the first time and it's part of the thrill of doing those is like it reminds me of when i first started to learn how to use the mpc mm -hmm. you know it reminds me of when i first started to write you know verses that you know weren't just like a strand of metaphors you know or, or like jokes you know like when you're mm -hmm. actually writing lyrics and writing a song that meant something mm -hmm. And learning what that feels like for the first time and then doing it again and being better at it and like yeah i'm lucky that i have like you know the reps in the studio to be able to make songs that i feel good about you know that you know and, and that but that comes from repetition and so starting and doing uh, you know something midway through you know, my life where I'm doing that again for the first time is really exciting. Um, but mm -hmm. I, but I think that it, it, the point of me bringing that up is, you know, it reminds me of this sort of equation of people that think that talent comes from, you know, talent is something you're born with as if it's, you know, an ethnicity or or an orientation it, the, talent is is totally different than those things you know it is something that is honed over time and yeah starting these new things teaches me or reminds me how much like what i do in in making music is not natural it, it's totally forced <laughs> it's something that i hammered hammered myself to do um and i don't know i think when you've been around you can tell like you know the difference between great music and and you know music that's just kind of there particularly in hip-hop where everybody does it is the amount of time that somebody's put into practicing their craft mm -hmm. and that doesn't necessarily mean like sitting in a corner and rapping in a mirror for eight hours a day that means you know, how many songs did you make this week? You know, um, if you, if, if you, if you can go like a year without writing a song, then it's probably going to show unless you're already like, you know, in the books, you know what I mean? Like, um, but if you're somewhere in your twenties or thirties or even your forties and you just can take a year off and not write anything, then I, totally antithesis to like the way that i create and i i think that it it will show and I, I think that that's just more proof of like i think a lot of people get talent 
in art confused with talent in um, like athletics. Mm. Um, even then, though, that's still like sure. Even athletes have to like really learn how to how to move, how to use their bodies, and they you know figure out exactly how to like attune themselves perfectly for whatever they're trying to do. Like, yeah, like I guess like you are like certain people are built certain ways, but that doesn't necessarily like I'm tall, but I can't play basketball. Like, yeah. like that's, it's that kind of thing. Like, you know, tall people's like, Oh wow. Have you ever, have you ever played basketball? And it's just like, that's not, that, those two don't like equate to one another. You know, you have to know how to like, you have to, you have to make yourself good. You have to make your, your, your tools work for you. Yeah. You're right. It's that is true. I I, I mean, you have to actually it, it is a similar process. I think, you know, you may have a natural inclination to be drawn to sports, whether it's because of your physical stature or because of your willpower. Um, and that really gives you an edge to actually be there, like you said, really well, like, you know, it really comes down to how long do you really want to do this? You know, are you going to hang around and do this long enough yeah. where you actually get good? And whether that's, you know, dunking a basketball or, you know, writing a song, like it doesn't happen on the first time. And I think the, no. I don't know where the conception comes from that, you know, people just like accidentally make great art. Yeah. You know, like, oh, whoops, like here it is. <laughs> you know, I just, I, I really think that people think that. And I think it's the, you know, it's a combination of a lot of things. I mean, it was mm. prior to this, but you know, there's the American idolization of, mm. you know, the audience where, you know, we're just led to believe that, you know, these people just stumbled onto a stage and, you know, they could sing really well and nobody knew, you know, they're just wasting their time in a karaoke bar and here they are on national TV all of a sudden, you know, they're winning American Idol and, that's not how that show works. And that's not how like real no. life works. Um, and, it, but, I, but I also think that it kind of predates that. I think people have thought this sort of thing about art, um, you know, the whole, like he's a natural, you know, sort mm -hmm. of theory about how art works, um, you know, overlaid with the subjectivity thing, you know, I mean, people, people love Dolly, but I don't, I don't really, I used to like Dolly when I was like 20, but like, I don't really like to look at Dolly anymore. Maybe it's because I found out like more about him himself, but fucking fascist. I, yeah, exactly. So fucking like piece of shit fascist who stole a bunch of ideas from better people. That's fair. Anyway, um, but yeah, he um, <laughs> struck a nerve. Yeah, I know. Right. But I, you know, I mean, and there's other artists out there that, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I respect Andy Warhol, but like, I don't, I don't ever look don't at Andy Warhol's paintings and think like, oh, wow, my life is changing, you know, um, whereas oh, there's other people, you know, there's abstract artists like um, Alvin Loving, um, Alex Rothko, hmm. Joseph Alders, you know, that there are some people that look at their paintings and are just like, this is just a fucking orange square with a red square around it. Fuck this shit. But I think it's amazing. You know, yeah. so it's, it's oh, that shit's beautiful. super subjective, you know, what talent is. So I, I don't know, man. I, I, I thought like watching that series, you know, I was kind of like on board for everything that was being said because it was so cranky and New Yorky and it was awesome. And it's, it's like comical this how is... ridiculous it is. This is just like too cranky for you. This is like no, I just too, can I, too cantankerous to take for NASA. I watched. I watched it. Well, there are lots of too, <laughs> too overly cantankerous takes for me, especially now. But um, you know, I I watched that that particular episode because I knew we were going to talk a little bit about about this today, and I watched it a second time, and it wasn't as like a back taking the second time I watched it but it was definitely a point where I was like no that's it doesn't matter that you've lived in New York since the late 60s and that like you hung out with Charles Mingus 
and that you're like this really respected writer and you're in your 70s and you're just you're just wrong about that you know and that's another thing that you kind of come to grips with over time is like sometimes people that are really um well established in their field or experience in life can still be wrong about a particular thing um so yeah i mean it also that is a good context to point out for her example is like like I guess she wrote for a newspaper that uh, Charles Mingus's wife ran in New York City. And so she knew Mingus really well. And, you know, when you see talent like Mingus's, it's kind of like, it would be easy to think that anyone else is a hack. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because oh, like, yeah. I mean, just I watching him play and doing what he does, it's like, but there's different talents, you know what I mean? Like there's, there, yeah. it's, it's not everyone has to be, you know, this like the best stand up bass player of all time. Like, you know what I mean? Like not everyone has to play these complex jazz pieces. Jazz is like algebra, you know what I mean? But you still need people that are good at arithmetic, you know? And it, yeah. it's- I mean, fucking Mingus, I think notoriously like didn't care for Coleman and Ornette is incredible. Too. Right. So, well, Mingus apparently didn't care for anybody. <laughs> one of the she tells a story on the episode about how he chased her up the street until neither of them could run anymore because he was angry at her. Um, while he was on, st he left the stage when he saw her walk in and chased her outside into the street up 20 blocks. Um, oh, wow. But, uh, what a story. Yeah, apparently he got fired by Lewis, uh, not Lewis, um, Duke Ellington. Uh, apparently he got fired by Duke Ellington, and, and and after that, like he was the only person that could put Mingus in his place, is how she described it. Is, <laughs> like he was a very egocentric guy. Yes, There's a great clip of him in the documentary, um, like holding a shotgun in his apartment. And whoever was filming him was like, why do you have a shotgun? And he was like, because somebody robbed me last week. He's like, and the reporter's like, really? And he's like, yeah, I think they were friends or enemies or both. Or like he said some shit like that. And I was like, wow, this guy was fucking, he was, he was really on one. But uh, I don't know oh, much wow. about Charles Mingus besides like hearing the music. So, um, but yeah, it's, I, I don't know, man. I think when you're, sometimes people are like overly judgmental as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all guilty of this. And I'm certainly guilty of it, of like, if you're not like, doing something that completely floors everything and is so technically ahead that you're you know you're not impressive sometimes just delivering a a quality verse is is enough you mm -hmm. know sometimes like doing triplicates is not necessary um sometimes you know being a bass player in in a competent rock band is is just as good as being you know a bass player in a very complex jazz ensemble you know like it different talent shows itself in different ways i feel like yeah. i guess if there's one message i would put into this episode just like don't be a critic like don't don't live your life being an art critic you yeah, know like that's, that's like very fair open your mind to to different things. I always go back to the, I think we've talked about this on the show in the past and I'll bring it up briefly before we get into the music, but like, I, I just remember it, it will always live with me, the reaction of my coworkers when somebody brought up the picture of the potato that got sold for like $10 million or something. Mm -hmm. um, and just how mind blown people are about that sort of thing with art and how touchy people are with like deciding what is art, what is not art. And it's, it, it causes a lot of like, um, harshness to entry in these art forms. I feel like, um, I've, I've had to teach myself over the last couple of years that like, you don't need permission to like buy canvases and paint and do what you want to do. Yeah. Like no one has to tell me like, Oh no, no, you've earned it now. Now you're a real painter. Like, no, you just, you just do it. You know, I think that's the antithesis mm -hmm. to the point that she was making, mm -hmm. you know, is that now everybody feels like they could do whatever they want and everybody is everything. And yes, there are negatives to that, but there are also positives to that. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have these gatekeepers telling you, 
no, you're not a real novelist. No, you're not a real rapper. You're not a real painter. You're not a real dancer. You know, like, um, now we live in a society where everybody can kind of do what they want and we have to decide how that works, you know, and set those rules.